So welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our very own Professor Randy Hampton here at the section of Cell and Developmental Biology uh, and Division of Biological Sciences. Randy is one of our award-winning faculty. Among other honors, he's received the uh, Undergraduate Teaching uh, Teacher of the Year Award here at UCSD from the Chancellor's Associate several years back. Uh, Randy has uh, entertained and educated, enlightened, inspired students and faculty alike here for many years. Uh, I know from personal experience, he can turn in a stodgy, turn a stodgy and boring faculty meeting into a delightful, entertaining event if you just <laughs> let him loose and, and if he goes for it. So we'll see what he does today. Um, Randy has been one of our more innovative uh, teaching faculty as well. And he has applied new technologies to uh, new approaches in the classroom. And so today he's going to talk about what he has done so far and some of his experiences and what he learned from these techniques. So, Randy. Pre-applause, it's something you rarely, rarely get in an actual talk, I mean a scientific talk. And uh, I've been giving seminars the last month all over the place. And, um, I'm much more nervous doing this because I'm really used to giving seminars. There's very tight constraints, and it's also something I've spoken about a lot. So the title of my talk is Texting in Class, and the actual full title is Texting in Class WTF, but I left that out because acronyms are problematic in science, right? And so, uh, <laughs> but actually this is a, a mis this is a misnomer because it's really me and about 1,500 undergraduates who've participated in doing this. Um, and that's actually, I'm kind of excited about this approach to, uh, to enhance, enhance interaction in the classroom. I have a, I'm not so sure I believe in the awesome power of online classes, just because anytime I have something online at home, it's one of the 20 things I'm paying attention to. And the classroom, I really do, and this might be old school, is, has a certain magic of interaction, just like the theater does. Uh, so the goal we have with that constraint is to convert a captive audience into a captivated audience. And that's really sort of, this is one aspect of that. And that involves participation and altering rhythm and making it a more human experience. So most of you know what text messaging is. It's also called SMS for a short messaging service or texting. And this is a perfect example of it. It's a, a way to communicate from one phone to another with text. And this is a, actually Steve Hedrick and I were having lunch one day, so he I wrote lunch, and he wrote sure, he's a man of many words. I wrote noon, he wrote check. So that's sort of the typical thing. There's also a variation of multimedia messaging, and this is an example of that. Someone went, yo, your mug is everywhere, and I put it should be in the post office. But this is a <laughs> typical, typical texting kind of thing. This is actually a student I know, who's a neuroscience student, sent this to me, and he saw it um, up on the billboard somewhere. Texting is incredibly common. It's, it's, it's done over all spectrums. People do it all over the place. It's incredibly easy to do. And actually, the reason I first thought of this is I just love texting. I love doing it because it's a great way to interact without the constraint of having to come up with something to say in the moment. So it's a little freer. It's also easy to do. And whoever thought of it is an incredible genius because it's very low bandwidth and very cheap to do, and yet you can charge a lot of money for it. So it's all brilliant. Um, interesting, though, although it's common, texting is often regarded as disruptive in the classroom. In fact, there's a term, disruptive technology, that I've heard applied to a number of different technological approaches, including this one. And um, in fact, you can see this in a lot of different contexts. This is one, uh, you know, we, I always have at the beginning of The Simpsons, Bart is, is writing some, some punitive phrase, and this is reference to that. You know, I will not use my crackberry in class. It's back when blackberries were dominant. This is actually a little more ominous. This is a set of slides you can download for a zoology class, and they have the initial sort of class mechanics part. And, and this, I suppose it's funny, but it says, no texting in class, blah, blah, no texting in class, blah, 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 no texting in class. So, so really, this, this person really doesn't want people to text in class. And so you might think, you know, the normal response when you say this is, that sounds like a really bad idea. And in fact, I bumped into one of my colleagues, a, a, a surprisingly a fairly grumpy colleague, although those don't usually exist in biology. And, and he walked up to me without saying, he goes, I'm never texting in class, and kept walking. So I, and he's not here today, so he won't find out how wrong he is. You know, We call that judgment prior to investigation. And it's a very, very bad thing to do. 
Anyway, I would like to point out, this, to make the statement, that despite the impression of it being disruptive and bad, uh, au contraire, the, the utility of it is, is actually surprisingly high. And I, I, if I can convince any of you to give this a whirl, that would be uh, awesome to put it into Southern Californian parlance. Okay, so here's the problem is, and, and this, I don't think this is a solution for all classrooms, but the usual class at UCSD and many, many other universities is very large. This is my uh, bi metabolic biochemistry final from last fall. We did it in the gym, go Tritons. And uh, this is a great way to do it, but it also lays out the full size of this class. It's about, there was about 400 people in this class. And that's a typical size class. And my man Yundi is here and he teaches the same class. And, and it's similarly huge. They're all really large classes. On top of that, the material for this particular class is very technical. It goes from atomic structure up to organ biology and even ecobiology with the, the molecular cycles that are involved in metabolism globally. So it's a very, very challenging class. On top of that, it's a, uh, it's, I guess you would call it a, uh, a pre-med and pre-dent filter or, 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 or or a hurdle class so that many, many students in those very challenging and competitive majors take this class as some sort of a, a step towards their goal. So there's a lot of reasons why students are very anxious in this class, uh, valid ones like the enormous amount of material and maybe more psychological ones like the stress of competing and all that, but they're all real stresses. The thing important to realize is fear and stress are as real as the people who harbor them. They're the real things. It doesn't matter what our judgments are, they exist. So this is a problem in the class, and there's two problems of scale that occur, and all of you know this, whether you're students in those classes, observers, or teachers of them, is it's hard to know what the students do know, and it's hard to know what the students want to know. Those are two big problems that never occur in a conversation with, a, let's say, a student. You say, what do you know? And they tell you. They say, here's what I want to know, and you find out. So these problems of scale are enormous, and they are... Uh, things we are challenged by all the time. So let's talk a little bit about the more familiar one of how do we ask students what they do know, because this has been more refined. And um, one of the problems with asking students questions, like even in this situation, is first of all, there's a real fear of speaking up in a 400-person group. You ask a question, and you know the really gifted professors, teachers, lecturers can draw out people to answer questions in a group. But 400 people, I mean, even I, and I have, I'm a very verbal person, as you all know, if I'm in an audience of four, 500, 600 people, I, am gotta, I ponder what I'm going to ask if I'm going to ask a question. It's not a trivial process. There's also a fear of or answering a question. I mean, there's a fear of being wrong or seeming unknowledgeable. It's hard for students to answer a question, especially if they're not completely aware of the answer. And it's also just difficult to get a read on the whole class. You know, if you're asking questions, there's always a few people who will raise their hands and answer them, but how about the whole class? And so that solution that's, that's been arrived at, and you know, I'd say it's an emergent, I don't know if it's disruptive, but it's an emergent technology, is the uh, venerated clicker. And you know, I was actually very resistant to use clickers. And the whole reason this text questioning, which is what I call like text messaging, get it? The, the whole reason this text question thing came up is out of a sense of guilt, because Amy P. and I decided one year, she's been a friend of mine for many years, and Amy Pasquinelli and I decided we're going to do clickers. We were chatting about teaching, and I, we, neither of us had adopted clickers. And I said, let's do it. Or she's like, let's do it. So we go get the boxes, we get the technology, and of course, because she's like the most organized person on the planet, totally institutes it, got it going, it's wrong. I live the box in my office for like six months and say, forget it, okay. So about three days before class, I went, must, there must be some way I could, you know, improve interaction with my class. Is there anything I could do? And this idea popped into mind, mostly out of sense of guilt and patching up what I didn't do with something I could do, which many of us know about. Like, we clean our houses when we have a grant to write, same idea, okay? So, uh, the clickers, you know, we result in, um, that was a little bit of a hyperlink, clickers result in a, uh, you know, a sort of a, a, a grouping of all the answers. You, you have a set of questions that you ask. They're pretty restrictive because they have to be A, B, C, or D, although I guess there are clever ways to refine that process. Um, and you get a nice read of the entire class. So there's really nice ideas that the whole class is sending answers to you when you pose a question. And it's really great because it's, you know, it's semi-anonymous or it's totally anonymous and it's 
Is there something? And it, it, it's anonymous. It's it's thorough. If you you know get enough people to do it, it's a very complete data set. And and I found them now to be very useful once I got over the activation and organization barrier. I think clickers are really great. Although I totally believe that the whole idea of having a doodad you have to buy and drag out of your bag is completely, it's going to go the way of the fax machine. You know, it's like, it just is, but it's a great initial foothold into that idea. Okay, well there's also a daunting task of asking questions. And in fact, getting students to ask questions is one of the huge challenges of the mo of, of of lecturers and of group interaction, and it's probably been around for as long as people have been assembling groups. You know, let's hunt a woolly mammoth. Any questions? You know, like <laughs> I, I'm sure that this has been around forever. And you know, in a situation like this, it's still daunting, even with 15, 20 people. Watch. Any questions? See, is um, it's it's daunting and it's difficult. But with a class of four or five hundred people, it is really a challenge. And, you know, like I said, and I sort of referred to this earlier, you know, many of us go to these big scientific meetings with five, six, seven hundred people, and it's really challenging to ask a question. You have to walk up to a microphone, all your esteemed colleagues are there, and it's a, a challenge. For students who are asking a professor a question, it's maybe even more terrifying because they have a, a less confidence base. So some of the daunting tasks to ask are, I, I thought I had changed this, but is fear of speaking up in a 400-person group. They're kind of similar dynamic questions. A lack of confidence in a question's value, you know, like especially if it's a question like an idea the student might have, which of course, the questions we want most are not the sort of more procedural questions, but the idea questions. Like, well, what, is that possibly a way to cure cancer? I mean, those are the kind of questions that we love students to ask, but they're the scariest to ask because they are, require a little creativity. As a fear of appearing to be a know-it-all. So this is the opposite. opposite. Students don't want to, you know, it, the idea is to stay unique in a group but not be too different. <laughs> you know, it's a real psychological challenge to be a human, really. And um, also a fear of breaking the flow of the class. You know, the class is rolling along and, you know, students are, it's, it's just, all of these are, and you, you notice I have fear and apprehension. I have no problem with considering that and bundling that as part of the way I teach. You know, it's an empathy base because I live in constant quaking fear of all things. No, I'm kind of kidding about that. But I do understand that phenotype, and I think it's a valuable uh, mode of empathy. Okay? I know professors I've talked to, they go, oh, don't, don't buy into their fears. They need that. <laughs> but I'm maybe a little, I'm too, more touchy-feely and whatnot. So this is my view. And like I say, this is just one modality. You do not need to adopt it. So the idea is that texting, just like clicking is a way for each student to answer a question that's posed to them, texting is a way for each student to pose a question without fear and semi-anonymously. So I want to talk about that. Um, so one of the great things about it is there's a certain safety because uh, it allows them to do it semi-anonymously. And this is just an example of an actual question I got texted me. And you can see it can be very information dense. So this is for the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle, the slide show it entering the electron transport chain at complex 3. But in the problem set, answers say you enter a complex 2. Does it matter which one of it specifically, or do we just need to know? So it's a, you can get a lot of informational density from this. Okay, It's not like clickers at all. In fact, it's the opposite problem. Like, whoa! <laughs> you know, so, so this is you know, one of the challenges. Um, and this is sort of the, the way it looks. Um, Texting is semi-anonymous. Oh, that, that was a problem. I don't know what happened there, but this was supposed to, <laughs> this was supposed to slide away and, uh, and yield just a, the, there's a phone number behind here. And the reason I say semi-anonymous is because uh, it's actually the perfect thing. As students can send you a clicker question, and this is actually, are you going to pass around the candy? Susan Golden did, and it was on Halloween. I also hand out candy, but awesome, my sister. So empathy-based, you know, honey works better than vinegar, like that thing. And so uh, uh, this is an example of a student, like there are very few students who probably would raise their hand and say this, but it's a totally reasonable concern, you know, like because like, students are constantly hungry. That's like one feature up, up through the postdoc level, I believe, from my own lab. And so, you know, I call my lab the locusts because they just, you can put calories out all the time, constantly, and they disappear. So... And, and then the data arrives, so it's a good deal. Um, so this is just an example. And what I, this was supposed to peel away and show that there's a phone number there, which I had X'd out. 
And um, the reason that's really great is because you, if you look at a phone number, unless you're some kind of you know, mentat, you're not gonna remember what it is, but it gives you a little foothold just to keep things a little civil. Like if somebody were to text me, I'm gonna kill you and your family, I would have that number in hand and probably either call it or give it to the police. <laughs> but, but you know, it creates a, a sense of semi-anonymity because it's sufficiently veiled that people can, can do this without, you know, unabashedly, but it, it creates a little bit of accountability. So it's, it's, I didn't think of this when I was doing this, but it actually really, it helps a lot. Um, so the nice thing about this also is you can have responses in class or later. Since you have the phone number in this way, I'm going to tell you, you can answer them student by student or as a group. So this one, hey, Dr. H, what's the benefit of using, these are all real texts that come to the class. I didn't, you know, they I love like the, yo, Dr. H, what's the benefit? Some of them just go, Hampton. Like they're just like, Hampton. What? It's like, okay. So they, I tell them the one thing they're not allowed to do is call me Mr. Hampton, because that just sounds really old and stodgy. They can call me doctor or hey, hole or what, it's video, hey. But they, um, yeah, the sounds are, hey, there's something wrong with the sound. Um, or, but it, that's really, you know, completely free. So Dr. H, what's the benefit of using GTP as opposed to ATP for uh, oxaloacetate and phosphonoprime? I mean, Yundi's like, oh, come on, I know all this, right? Uh, during gluconeogenesis, don't both provide enough energy for the reaction to be spontaneous. So I like this kind of question. They're like thinking, like, why would this be? You know, the why questions are rare. The how questions are the ones they're all accountable for. The truth is, I don't know. That's how the enzyme evolved. Don't know why. I actually texted this person later because it came up near the end of class. But you know, I, I, this is the. There's a lot of a lot of flexibility in this. Okay. So here's the thing. You know, this crossed my mind, and uh, you know, the first thing I thought was, well, I'll just give them all my cell phone number. Now that's it. four in the morning. What the why did you give me a B? <laughs> right? Like, you know, is this my wife? What? No. So. So, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable concern. It's give the students my, uh, my cell phone number, and this is texties over my dead body, right? That's OMDB, right? And so uh, it's a reasonable question. I was thinking about how could I do this uh, in a way that protects a little bit of my, you know, free space, my privacy. And actually, I've been watching The Wire, which is this absolutely brilliant, brilliant uh, HBO series. It's really incredibly, remarkably gritty, smart, nuanced, interesting, societally uh, observational uh, five season series about the Baltimore crime scene and the police and journalism and education. It's an amazing, it's amazing. It's sort of like if Seinfeld were all dark, but just as complete as that, right? And so, um, but in it, they, the, one of the things they do is there's this constant interaction between the the drug dealers and the other criminals and the police, and it all involves electronic communication and trying to thwart that. It's a really interesting show by this uh, journalist, David Simon, who's also worked in education. He's an incredible writer. And they use this kind of phone called a burner. And a burner is a cell phone you buy like at a Walmart and use a little bit and throw away. And I guess the terrorists use them and all sorts of dark creatures <laughs> use them who want their privacy protected. I thought, well, this is an interesting. So first, I looked into just buying a burner, which, you know, they're very cheap and compared to the cost of running a class or the awesome salary that I make. I'm kidding, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> the dean is, even with the paltry salary I make, I could still afford a burner. I thought that'd be cool. So that was sort of step one. But then I came to realize that with smartphones, there's no need for burners, you know, if you're not like a criminal, because like, I don't really care if the NSA reads the text that I'm sending between students or not, you know. Um, so the, you can actually, there's a variation of this, which is called app-based texting, where you can get apps to uh, do internet-based texting. So it's sort of like VoIP, voice over internet protocol, but with texting, okay? It's very straightforward. It's free or cheap texting apps for smartphones, both iOS and Android. They, they're internet-based reception of phone origin text. So this is cool. Someone can take a regular old phone, even one of those clamshell phones that your grandmother has. I've fallen! Help me! You know? And... Um, and I guess Wilhelm has a clam jump. So my gra your grandmother and Jim Wilhelm. I've fallen and it's very interesting and I want to talk about it for an hour. That's, that's Jim falling. So, so um, anyway, um, so the great thing is any phone can send a text through this and then it comes through the internet. So you don't need your phone or phone hookup in the class. You just need 
Wi-Fi in this universe, yeah, most universities have incredibly good Wi-Fi coverage, and it's high density, so you could have hundreds and hundreds of people doing it at the same time without a problem, okay? And, and it's not dependent on, um, uh, I'm gonna retract what I just was thinking. My mouth works a little bit faster than my brain, but not always, okay. So anyways, um, and then it's distinct local phone number that's not your cell number. So this is a great feature. When you get one of these text-based apps, you either pay a small amount of money or get free a phone number that is a dedicated phone number only for that texting, and that's really useful. And since it's local, it's usually the same area code, so it's easy for students to, uh, to use it. So these are some examples of text apps, and there's tons of them. Like if you go to your phone and and search the app store or whatever for texting, you'll get dozens of different textings. And these are two of them. One's called, the first one I use is called Text Plus. You can tell it's on my phone because it says open. And the other uh, said, Rick, it's going to get better. No, I know. I know you got a, a defense. Congratulations to your student. I'm sure it'll be awesome. Actually, I have a funny Rick story, but based on this is he had a, this, remember this? <laughs> remember this? Oh, okay. Oh, never mind, I forgot the story. <laughs> okay, so Rick and I, no, we were going down to Tijuana once. No, I'm kidding. So this was actually really sweet. Rick had someone, um, someone defending their thesis, and we were listening to it. And on the screen, which appeared on the thing, it said, you're doing great, Rick, because <laughs> he had sent some kind of a chat thing. And we've never been able to figure out whether he did it on purpose or whether it was an accident. So. So, you know, technology, disruptive and emergent technology. So these are two different text apps. This is the one we're now using uh, more, and this is the one. But both of them work fine, and they basically, same idea. You get a number, and you are able to do text messaging that's based on the internet from a private source, and it's free, and it doesn't cost you anything either. Okay, so you can also, people have also figured out that Google Voice allows us. So you can set up a Google account and get text messaging that's sent either to your phone or to your computer through Google. So there are a lot of variations of this. They're all basically texting over internet protocols, okay? So the basic procedure for TQing is you gotta choose a mobile text app, and we're now using text free. Uh, you gotta get or purchase a local number, easy, an easy to remember one smart. And so this is, an, I just had to do this today because I had to re-up my text free account. So this, when you say, I'd like a number, it gives you a whole scrolling list, and you kind of choose the easiest to remember. So I like this one because four and seven is three apart, and there's a three there, and it's three, three, three. And it's like, I, I really, this really helps as you're in middle class, and you have to remember this. Okay, so this is the number we chose. You know, test and verify that it works. Okay, it's real important. You don't want to drag this into class and go, oh, and so you want to figure it out. Figure out how you want to process text questions. You know, you got to think about this a little bit, um, and then tell the class about it, and then dive in. Okay. Now the next slide; these next slides are actually uh, the uh, notice the format change. Where this are the slides I used to inform the class about our experiment in text questioning. So this is what I when the first day of class I tell them about this. Okay. So I say we're and I tell them we're going to we're involved in an experiment. Now I could consider this though it's been four seasons that I've done this, so that's why I say 1,500 or so students have participated with me in this experiment, and I say we're, you know, the first experiment is clickers and that kind of stuff, and I say this is the second experiment we're doing in which we're going to go the other way and have you pose questions to me instead of me pose questions to you and you answer them, um, and it's texting, so this is a fun thing. Honk, if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet him. This was actually out there somewhere on, somewhere on the highways of America, I thought that's a good way to put it, you know, it's, um, you know, and we're probably, the use is, is honk if you love whatever deity it is you choose to, or not to, and, and if you want to meet that entity, then text while you're driving, but it's much more cumbersome, so this is simpler. Um, and then what I do is use a flag during lecture uh, to ask, or, uh, or I want people to either ask questions or to text, and I actually use this during the course of lecture, uh, this particular stopping point to assess it. Okay, and so uh, I tell the class, you know, there's a bunch of acronyms that are useful in texting, and you can use them here as LMAO, we all know that. Uh, what the F are you saying? That's really useful for students. Uh, can I have an A? That's another one. Um, if I don't get an A, my life is over. You know, these are all standard, standard, uh, I mean, I'm kidding, they're not really. That one's standard, the rest I kind of made up. <laughs> Although this one you hear all the time, so. 
Um, and then there's one that actually is problematic is, is that going to be on the test? <laughs> Hold on. And I tell, them, I tell them, if we could possibly not do that during the text questioning, that would be useful. And the reason I tell them that, it's just sort of a probability diminishing thing. Because they will always ask, and they're allowed to ask, and it's a fair question. But I have very elaborate mechanisms in such an information dense class to let them know it's on the test independently and iteratively and repetitively. So this is the only reason I dissuade them from doing that. And it decreases the probability from like 90% to like 10% to, to dissuade them from doing this. And I'm sure anyone in an information dense class deals with this. There was a question from my dean. Okay. Yeah, we, well, we're going to do that. OK, cool. So we, I, we have this thing. And let's dive in. So this uh, number, actually, this number is an active number. Let's see if it works. Oh, I have a text from someone else. Hold on. I got a code. And I don't know if this is going to work, but it better. The lecture is invalid. And so let's see. Uh, we're ready to receive the gift of text questions. There's one now. Randy, that's me. <laughs> OK, that's me. Waiting. Hello. Uh, I'm getting more info. Is this from Bill? Most, most young people text with both fingers, you know. <laughs> no, 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 like this, like this. Yeah. OK, there's one. There's one. What is LMAO? Life may alter often. <laughs> Max R. Why not write the number on the board? Beautiful. I don't, because they don't, they're too busy setting up the video to give me any whiteboard markers. So, oh, wait. Oh, up, 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 up. Now, this means I have to remember. This is where the awesome utility of an easy to remember number. Yeah? Now, watch, I'll put a different one in here just to mess with your heads. <laughs> oh. OK. Now, Here's the thing, is they come start trickling in. And before I used to have it so it would buzz and ring, and it would drive me completely mad during lecture. And I am so ADD, like I don't even get to the second D, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so I've been constantly being distracted. So this is an experiment I'm doing for you to help you not have to do this. It says, knock, knock. Uh, what if students text you at 1 AM? We'll get to that. <laughs> and then another says, Randy, hello. Anyone there? Knock, knock. OK, good. We're having fun here. And it seems to be working. Thank God. <laughs> All right. How to invalidate your whole lecture. Here's a great technique that I can't make work. <laughs> so, um, so here's a really good question is, how do I juggle TQing and lecturing? Right? Like This seems like two really disparate processes going on. And um, so first of all, you have to find a time interval but for checking and response. There's a sweet spot of how often you're going to check. If you check constantly, there'll be no lecturing. If you don't check at all, there'll be no answering questions. So there has to be a sweet spot. And I think that depends on the class, on the individual, on the avidity with which the students text. It's something you'll figure out for your classes. And just like clickers, it breaks up flow. You know, you have to break the flow. And I contend this is actually an incredibly useful feature of this, which I'll talk about a little later. And then TAs can also serve as intermediates, and I'm going to talk about that later. Okay, so but one can do this without any intermediates, just by oneself. And the basic idea is that at various intervals, you stop and ask for questions like you would normally as a lecturer, because lectures do that hopefully, and then also include a um, a rejoinder to do this. So I actually use this slide interspersed throughout my lectures periodically. And I, the density of those, I adjust depending on the nature of the material and, and the, the class itself, in which I ask people to ask questions in vivo, you know, in real time, um, in the biological world or in the electronic world. You know, so that's one of the things. Um, now, texting can pose real challenges. It can be problematic. This is a very <laughs> famous video of this poor lady who not only texted her way into a fountain, but was filmed doing it. And this, this video went viral in a big way. I think about 25 million people have watched this. Now 25 million and 40 people have watched this. this is from another angle. 
This is a, and, and, and the most depressing thing here, this is from, yes, yeah, from the cycle. The most depressing thing is there's a soundtrack of these like young people in the security region having an incredibly great time watching this poor lady fall into the fountain. Here she comes. She's texting away, texting away, fountain, bam, and in she goes. <laughs> You know, and I presume her BlackBerry stopped working, but uh, you know, it keeps on keeps on texting, right? So there are prob potential problems with uh, with this. So here are some of the challenges uh, posed by text questioning: is it's important to include the in vivo questions as well as the e questioners. I mean, the goal is not to get people to stop participating in class; it's to bring more people in. Okay. Uh, and I actually, this is kind of funny. This is one of the texts I actually got, is the person in the red shirt has their hand raised to ask a question. <laughs> in the early days, I was not paying attention to the class, and somebody actually texted me that someone wanted to ask a question. This, that's a real, that really happened. I thought that was kind of great. And then also, they'll mess with each other. They'll say someone wants to ask a question. Use a friend of theirs just to mess with them. So you have to sort of have some nuance you know, about that. But so far, so good. OK, so that's one of the challenges posed by text questioning. OK. Another important challenge is to not blend social texting with class-based texting yourself. As I said, I'm a huge fan of texting. I text constantly. I had to switch my plan to like unlimited because I was going broke. And uh, I just, I think it's a wonderful way to communicate. But here's the problem. This is Jessie Riesdorf. She's my personal trainer. She's my core trainer. I go to her once or twice a week when I'm training for a race especially. This is her husband who looks strangely like Dax Shepard from Parenthood. I have never figured that out. He's not <laughs> Dax Shepard. She's a very dear friend. They've both been to my house many times. He and I are planning to run an ultra marathon in South Africa someday when we get the chance to do it. He's from South Africa. That's Jesse. And we uh, text all the time. We communicate. So one evening I was texting her and texting some students, because people say, what if they text you late at night? That's fine. I use this as a channel of communication, although it's more important in class. And uh, so I was texting Jessie, and she wrote, back to the gym in the morning, because I had been away for a few weeks. I went, that is cosmic. I was just about to text and say yes, like I lived one of those things. She goes, cool. And I wrote, it reveals our deep and forbidden <laughs> bond. Okay, And she goes, yes, it does. But this was after I was texting this student here. So the student was texting about, you know, they said, oh, I see, thank you. They were asking about, uh, my, my battery's out. They were asking about uh, something on, uh, on one of the lectures, and I explained, and they go, oh, I see, great. And then I'm just trying to get a battery out of here. And so um, I said, oh, th and, and I said, yay, you understand. And then I texted again and wrote, it reveals our deep and forbidden <laughs> bond to this poor student. <laughs> And um, I, but I want my advancer too, so let me do this. And so, you know, that could be a bad situation, but fortunately, I have a good rapport with my class, and I live an honest and good life. And so, uh, let's see, his has to go like this. So, what happened was the student right away wrote, ha ha, indeed, <laughs> and, <laughs> which I thought was pretty, pretty liberal of them, you know, it's, instead of calling their lawyer. And uh, so, I. Uh, let me make sure I got this right. Yay, OK. Um, and then I wrote right away. I said, oops, that was for a friend. I am very, very sorry. And they wrote, LOL. I had no clue what you meant, so I just agreed. So, it's like, <laughs> so this, is a, this is actually a pretty happy situation. And I actually showed these slides in class because I wanted to make fun with it. And I wanted the students to all know that, you know, that, <laughs> that this kind of thing happens and that it's an experiment we're doing together. And, I think a lot of this depends on the rapport you have with the class. You know, that could be interpreted in many different ways. And this person was really fun and cool about it. And I've got another extremely amusing text that I, I think they send them to me hoping I'll put them up on the board because they are pretty wild, you know. And, uh, and, and also, I think, you know, one of the things is that, that there's a level of nuance in this about the kind of text you get. But, um, you know, one question people probably have is, oh, look, at there's a whole bunch of stop, but stop and look. Say, hey, Dr. H, why did the chicken cross the playground? <laughs> to create a forbidden bond. <laughs> uh, do you answer every question? Um, I answer many, and then what? And one thing I'll often do is compile all of them and put them online, You know, answering them on a, on a, a growing list of questions. And now I have done this enough time that they're frequently asked questions that come up a lot. And that's a matter of choice. 
how many questions do you get an answer? You get about between 10 and 50 in a class, depending on the nature of the material. It's, of course, going to map to the difficulty of the material. Um, see, this is working. Is that funny? Do TQs discourage in vivo questions how to balance the two? I'll get to that. These are all awesome questions. OK, um, so here's, uh, this is another problem that's a little more serious than the Jesse Riesdorf training question. I actually was texting Jesse this morning going, can I use, I need a really wholesome picture of you. <laughs> so um, she goes, why? Because <laughs> so, we have a forbidden bond. And so, um, OK, so this is, uh, this is what I call the timeline problem. So the problem with text applications, and this makes perfect sense, is they're organized by user. OK, so they're organized by users. So if 30 students write questions at different times, they're organized by the students. So this question, this student wrote a bunch of questions. Here's a couple. Here's a couple. We're talking about CB1, the cannabinoid receptor and appetite and all that kind of stuff. And um, then this, this, uh, this person, we're all asking questions on December 11th, and they're interdigitated in time. So this is another reason one has to come with a fairly ungrainy uh, uh, access time, because if you wait too long, you're going to get a lot of interdigitated questions. Okay, so this is actually something that was challenging, but then I, we have the Yellen variation. So Debbie Yellen has uh, decided she wanted to try this. And actually, I think four or five different professors and a number of TAs that I've had have gone off and done this technique. And Debbie, if, what I've learned about Debbie, because she has a super powerful brain, is if you give her brain something to chew on, she's going to spit out something better than went into it. And so um, and this is an example of that. So she came up with this variation that I really like. And it basically goes like this. The class send their text questions to a TA or somebody with uh, that app on an iPad or on a device. And then those students send you the questions one at a time. And this is a very sort of old school way to, to temporalize, to linearize the temp timeline. So you just get every question as they come. And it's not hard because these text free and text apps allow you to forward to another number. That also allows you to use your own phone or even your own number. So you can use, have a lot of familiarity. Another feature of this that, that answers this other idea is the TAs can also answer some of the simple questions like where's the final or you know what, what is phosphorylopyruvate you know those kinds of things. The only reason I don't love this is because the TAs in a helpful way will filter out some of the stranger but more useful questions as fodder for fun in conversation and that's sort of a that's a, a, a decision you have to make yourself and with so sometimes I just like the full timeline sometimes this is really useful and it depends. I've thought also it must be possible for someone to write a macro for, the, for a computer where it gets in text and then forwards it automatically. I don't know how to do that, but that must be something that could then. So you could just have a, a receiving computer that then sends it to linearize it. Or better yet, someone should write an app that's made for this that linearizes the text as opposed to groups them by user. That must be something that's easy to do. But I don't know anything about this. Um, so what are the outcomes? You know, people want to know what the outcomes are. Because texting is user organized, it is easy to count the number of people who use this route of inquiry. So during class, I get, you know, between like 10 and 50 questions, right, all texted to me. And the, uh, the, that's one a gauge. of how, So you get a lot of questions. And this, I think, is really useful. But another thing you can do is you can take the text-free app. And as long as too many people aren't doing it at night, and they stop doing that after a while because I just don't answer them at night, not because I mean or anything, I just don't get to it, is um, you can count how many people have sent text because it's organized by user. And so the answer is in a 400-person class last year, 127 students used this approach to send text during class. Now, the, this... I, and so the next question is, it does not seem to diminish the in vivo question. So that's subjective. I haven't really counted. You have to do one of those things where, like what Stanley or, you know, Laurie Smith does, where you actually, you know, count and decide and figure it out. And we haven't done that. But I will tell you, there's a small number of people who always ask questions. They usually sit in the front row. And they, uh, not always, but often. And that group grows with time. And it's usually more like 10 or 15 people out of a 400 person class who are the question askers. And those have not gone away. And in fact, I would even contend the breaking up of the class and promoting conversation enhances them. So it seems like the in vivo questions are still there. And the, uh, and the electronic ones are additional to that. OK. Uh, so the, another question is text questioning disruptive to classroom procedures. 
you know, to cross from process. And I've heard, I've actually heard, you know, you saw those sort of semi-amusing slides about not texting in class. And there, are, if you go on the internet and just Google texting in class, you get dozens, hundreds of threads of people trying to figure out how to get students to not text in class, which is like trying to get people to not breathe, I think. It's just too, too, it's too common and too standard, especially 400 person class. Like, what are you gonna do? So I feel that this is a way to direct that Twittery energy towards a uh, towards a goal, but also I think it's disruptive in a good way. It's yes, it's disruptive in the same useful way that clickers are. Like I've started to use clickers, I love them. I think it's very valuable. But I think two of the features of clickers that are really valuable, independent of the information flow, is a it breaks up the class and gives you a seventh inning stretch. It gives people a chance to breathe and interact and collect their thoughts and to uh, relax for a second. And one thing I've noticed is when I do clickers, uh, during that time, even though I don't do this, you know, interactive group solving clickers, which is all awesome, I just haven't gotten to that yet. You know, this reverse classroom where people self-instruct and then tell you, that's all great. I don't do any of that, but during the clicker period, they all talk to each other. They just chill out and, and interact and talk, and it just breaks up the rhythm of class. Like, I can't do anything for more than 20 minutes. Like what you're seeing here, me talking to you for almost an hour is crazy focused for me. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, I'm gonna take a break, I'll be back in a few minutes, like during a seminar, right? And so uh, to me, this kind of disruption is super valuable for creating, you know, alterations in the rhythm of the class, you know? So uh, I'd like to thank you all, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have, not text yet. So thank you. Pardon? Have you used What's that? I guess no. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's sort of like a chat room. Yeah. Is there a way that you could think to do something like this where while it's during class, they're not getting anything? You don't want them to be distracted by Yeah, well, one idea is a Facebook page. for One idea would be a Facebook page for the class, which is intriguing to me. Because Facebook, you can have separate topics and threads. You can post videos easily, pictures. But also, you can have conversations evolve on the timeline. So that's something I've thought about. And that sounds like a sort of more classroomy version. It sounds cool. So. Yeah, you could put them in there. That's right. And I, I also, huh? To bring all the students into it. Yeah, and another thing I do is I take now a subset of the questions that are of interest and post them online in the evening. You know, with my answers to them. So, but yeah, those are all interesting solutions. So here we go. Somebody says, "Oh, um, I agree with you with your texting not diminishing the in vivo questions in my mole bio." Molecular base of human disease, 43% of students ask at least one question via texting. That's Ella. Wait, who's Ella? No, I know, I'm kidding. Um, and then here's another one. Have you been accosted by top hat salespeople? Yes, but I have discovered something amazing about our phone system. They send a MP3 to your email, so you never have to answer your phone. Ever. <laughs> you just listen to what the message is left and then decide whether to call back. So don't be offended. If you want to talk to me, I'll give you my cell number. Um, are there any more questions? Yes. So you're using up there, the An iPad Air. First generation. No, it's, it's fine. It's, uh, and I, I usually give a T, I make a TA the text master general and I give him my iPad to work with during the class and then he or she forwards the text to me and that's actually worked pretty well. So, Amy. Yeah, you get it when you download one of these apps, you're given a free number and I think for a couple bucks you can get rid of all ads. Like the thing about apps are they're insanely cheap because of this large scale. It's just the economy of scale. So they're amazingly inexpensive and like that text free gave me a, a local area code number of set of choices and a memorable one three 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 four seven one three like that <laughs> um you know that i just chose from a group without paying anything and text plus i think you had to pay for a local area code and otherwise you get like i don't know some Romania, <laughs> some weird area code from who knows where so there uh, the solution's pretty straightforward yeah yes
Well, when, or no, to my phone. Yeah, you could do it with laptop too, but during power, PowerPoint is not good at interfacing things, you know, multitasking. Another part, the trouble is if you do it on PowerPoint, it might be projected here, or it might be there, and it's just, I sort of don't look at the laptop, I have my phone. But the, the, you could use solutions like that. There is a guy, this is interesting, when I first thought of this, I tell all my undergrads, I say, don't ever Google an idea you've just had. Because if you Google an idea you've had 99 since then, someone else has had that idea. But the important point is not the idea, but how you mature it, how you ferment it, how you process it, right? So I had this idea, and then I, a month later, I so said, I better check. <laughs> so I Googled, and not a lot of people are doing this, but there was a guy at Georgia Tech who decided to do this, and because it's a tech engineering type university, he figured out a way that every classroom could use this, but what it does is it scrolls the question along the bottom, like CNN Newsreader, now, I actually like the sort of filtering that goes like, you know, I don't think you have kids, do you? <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, after all, who would, right? So, like, so, you know, I'm not sure I love that idea. On the other end, it might create accountability because the students don't want to be disruptive. I don't know. It's another solution to that. And there's probably a hundred. Yes? I guess kind of something similar that I've heard people doing, although I, I can't say... Rather than going to using a phone number um, to um, opening basically like a class Twitter account, yeah, people yeah, ask questions through Twitter, right? and I could see some reasons why this approach would be a little bit more private. Whereas since Twitter is it's also it's 140 characters, hashtag your class sucks. I <laughs> you know, I mean, no, I, I'll tell you something. I saw that inspired me. It was after I started doing this, as I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, this sort of the Carl Sagan of the 21st century. I mean, he's Brilliant lecturer, and when he, I saw him give a talk at Abercabs, there was like four or five thousand people at a banquet of these excited, you know, underrepresented minority students, and he's he's just awesomely brilliant, right? And an astrophysicist to boot, and he like has he puts the audience in the palm of his hands, you know. But he had a Twitter thing going because they were talking about Pluto, and you know that was a very because like why did you do that to Pluto? And it was incredibly effective. But he had the Twitter feed on his, you know. PowerPoint, because it was sort of a showman thing. But it, I think that there are Twitter solutions. I just, A, I don't understand Twitter as well. I have an account, I follow people, but I don't get it as much, and I think it's really restrictive in terms of the number of characters, because each tweet is 140 or less, so like that. But, yes? Are there equity and access issues for students? Well, that sounds very LPSOE. I don't even know what those terms mean. <laughs> Oh, equity and access. So equity, if they don't have a mobile phone. Right. So different kinds of phones, different kinds of yeah. plans, which cost more money for students who may not be able to afford. Um, the question, and that's a wonderful question. Well, first of all, they're, they could use a text app, too. And then it's free for them, because it's internet. So the one equity issue is, uh, do they have a smartphone? And that you know is an issue, but I would say 90. I've actually done this and said, how many people can text? And I saw every single hand goes up. So there's probably equity access issues if you took this to the broader world. But I would say the chances of finding a college student who doesn't text or couldn't borrow their friend's phone to text. And I tell them, I said, you know, t take the friends next to you and text the question if you need to do that. I mean, it is important. I mean, I don't like to sort of assume someone's going to have a $400 doodad in their pocket. And I get that. So it is maybe a compromise, and maybe it will get easier as time goes on. But also now with computers, like with Macs, you can text you know, with Yosemite. And I presume with Windows 10 or whatever, you can text through that. So I think that'll really remove it even more. It is an issue I've thought of, though. I'm not trying to be flippant. Yes? Is that my mass spec guy? Get back upstairs! <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, you know, anything that makes a class a little more fun and a little more like ADD-ish distracted is good. So, you know, they, I mean, they, they, they definitely participate a lot. So when you get, you know, 50 questions as opposed to five, that's, you know, 10 times as much uh, interactiveness would be one way to view it. But, you know, I mean, I think also I'm lucky that I have a lot of extraneous social insecure energy and I apply it to the class so they like it. 
<laughs> I, mean, I don't know. If, I don't really know. The, the control experiment will be someone who has class hates them to have them text and see if they like it better. I don't, I don't really. <laughs> Stanley, there's a project where it's like, who's the worst teacher on campus? Here's a smartphone. <laughs> Not you. I mean, you and I would have this as a collaboration. We'd have to find that professor and see if they... Their awesomeness factor goes up. I mean, another thing, I hate to say this, but clickers have massively increased attendance. I like to think it's my amazing charisma, but it's not. It's like if you offer five points out of 400, everybody will come to class. It's like saying, I'm going to leave a penny under every seat, like sort of a, you know, a low-budget Oprah, and everybody comes. I mean, I don't get that. It's like five points. You know, you know I'll give you one bar of a plus. <laughs> you know, it won't be the whole plus, but... So, but it, it, and so I think attendance is high anyway, so that's not a gauge, that's high, high noise to signal, but I don't know. I mean, I think it increased also because I'm excited about it and the students perceive they're part of an experiment, you know, so that's fun too. And it also opens the doors for them to ask pretty outlandish, fun things, you know. And, and I don't have a problem with that, but I think that's where TA filtering would be good if you did have a problem with it, and that probably breaks down by type of person, type of class, type of topic, whatever, you know, so, yeah.